All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. If you've ever heard the words American Pilsner and thought to yourself, oh, that definitely means some gross macro beer, do me a favor and keep watching this video because we're gonna try and change your opinion today. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome to the channel. On this channel, I'll do videos like this one, grain to glass videos, uh, where you get to see the entire process all the way from start to finish on a beer, all in the same video. But I will also do shorter, more informative videos like equipment reviews and tips and techniques kind of videos as well. So if you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, and check out my channel page for more content like this. If you like the t-shirt that I'm wearing today, please go check out that merch store that's down below the description box as well. You'll find plenty of good stuff down there. Today we're working on the third installment of the uh, Pilsner series that I've been working on throughout this summer here and this is American Pilsner also known as Pre-Prohibition Pilsner. The BJCP kind of decided to change the category that defines this beer to Pre-Prohibition Lager uh, in 2015 and that's that's kind of what we're doing here, uh, but most sources will still cite this as American Pilsner. I'm sure my American viewers are very familiar with Prohibition and what happened during that time, but for my international viewers, I kind of want to go over the history of Prohibition a bit here. So, Prohibition was, well, for those of us who do enjoy beers and alcohol of other various forms, Prohibition was a very dark time during our country's history. Basically, during the 1910s and the 1920s, a movement grew in the United States that wanted to end the use of, or the sale of alcohol in general. This was a sort of religious-backed movement that uh, basically wanted to end alcoholism and violence within the home and a host of other apparently alcohol-related issues. It eventually made its way up into Congress and was eventually signed into law as an amendment to the United States Constitution. This amendment essentially made the uh, sale of alcohol illegal and it actually shut down a large part of the alcohol industry in the United States at the time. However, contrary to popular belief, it actually did not ban alcohol outright. Private use of alcohol within the home was not outright banned by federal law. However, at many state levels, that was different. Many of those state level archaic laws do still exist today in some way, shape, or form. Even here in my native New Hampshire, only wine and liquor can be sold in the same store, but beer must be bought in a separate store. In Massachusetts, to my south, you can buy beer, wine, and liquor all at the same store. However, it can't be sold on Sundays after a certain period of time. What happened during this time is, well, what happens when you legislate the flow of any sort of commodity. Uh, and that is that criminals it took possession of the market and the black market flourished during this time with uh, plenty of bootleg alcohol. During Prohibition, there was a significant increase in crime, alcohol was moved along the black market, and eventually on December 5th, 1933, the 21st Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, overturning the previous amendment that had enabled Prohibition, and this allowed commercial sale of alcohol in the United States to resume. This led to a significant decrease in crime related to alcohol. America has always been an extremely diverse country, and before Prohibition, many people who were producing alcohol in the United States were immigrants. Before Prohibition, a significant portion of America's beer brewing population were German immigrants. Uh, these German immigrants brought over with them a culture of beer brewing that used to permeate the United States before Prohibition. Very similar to Germany, most towns actually had local breweries and brew pubs that would serve local beer. Made by these people who emigrated from Germany with the knowledge to make the beer that the Germans make, but working with American ingredients. This is how the American Pilsner, or the pre-prohibition Pilsner, was born. The same is true with many other beer producing nations, such as England and the Czech Republic. But the immigrants from those countries during the 1800s brought their beer brewing prowess with them and made use of it with American ingredients, creating entirely different beer styles. However, sadly, Prohibition itself stamped most of that out of existence entirely, leaving only beer that could be mass-produced by corporations such as Anheuser-Busch in existence. Hence the massive takeover by what is now today macro beer uh, post-Prohibition. So unfortunately, many of the pre-Prohibition beers in America were simply lost to history after Prohibition. However, in the last 30 or 40 years, 
recipes for pre-prohibition styles have started to pop back up and the pre-prohibition pilsner is amongst them. This recipe is based off of what either a German or Czech brewer immigrating to the United States would have actually made when they came across the ingredients that were actually available in the United States. And it involves one very specific and peculiar ingredient, and that is six-row barley. Six-row barley malt was much more prolific in the United States than two-row barley malt. And the difference between six and two-row is simply that on the head of the barley stalk, with where the seeds are, they actually grow in a sort of hexagonal pattern with six rows of barley seeds on them instead of two rows on opposite sides of the barley stalk. And in fact, the six row barley is genetically quite different than the two row barley and has pluses or minuses for beer making. Six row malt has a stronger diastatic power than two row. And what that means is that it's able to convert the starches that are in other more difficult malts to convert like caramel malts or adjuncts. And it is able to unlock those starches to convert them into sugars during the mashing process. However, it does come with a rather significant drawback in that it creates a significant more amount of DMS or dimethyl sulfide than your typical two-row Pilsner malt would. DMS typically manifests itself as a rather corny flavor that can be unpleasant. Sometimes it comes across as a vegetal flavor as well in beer. Generally, it's not a good thing. However, it's a volatile chemical, and during the boiling process, you are able to get rid of pretty much all of the DMS that's in beer so that you don't need to worry about tasting it during the final product. The beer we are making today is going to be entirely different than both German Pilsners and Czech Pilsners. It's going to have some elements that are shared between both beers, however, and a unique American flair. And hopefully what we get at the end of the day is nothing like an American macro lager. And I hope it goes to show that America had a fantastic beer and brewing culture prior to the prohibition. American beer doesn't need to be some tasteless macro lager or some massively hyped IPA. Either of those things are fine, however, there is a lot that has been lost to history and is now starting to kind of make a comeback, and I think it's really worth exploring, especially in this case. So please join me in this process as we try to make a pre-prohibition Pilsner. So for our recipe, we are starting out with six pounds of six-row malt. This is actually not a Pilsner-style malt, this is more of a pale malt. It's akin to two-row in terms of color and uh, sort of in akin to flavor, but it does have a little bit of a flavor variance that we're gonna experience for ourselves at the tasting. We're adding to that three pounds of flaked corn. Corn was a very common crop in the United States even during the 1800s when these beers uh, were being brewed. And uh, it lent a very different flavor to the beer than the continental uh, Pilsners that you would get from Europe. Flaked corn, as opposed to just straight up corn meal, uh, has the benefit of being pre-gelatinized, which means you don't need to do a cereal mash on it. At the beginning of the pandemic last year, I did a cream ale, and since I wasn't able to get to the home brew store, I just used corn meal, and I had to do a cereal mash on that in order to unlock the starches. Now, it's an additional step that probably would have been done back in the day. However, nowadays we have the flaked corn uh, adjunct available to us. And that just really increases the convenience factor here, but it is the same effect overall. And lastly, we're gonna be adding three ounces of acidulated malt to the grist in order to keep the pH in check. So perhaps we're using some old school American hops uh, that haven't really changed ever since the 1800s. And we're gonna add some new school American hops on top of that. So we're gonna add one ounce of crystal as a first word hop. Uh, crystal is one of the OG American hops and first word hopping is something that would have been done as if you were brewing a Czech Pilsner. I really did enjoy the way that it came across the uh, bitterness wise with my Czech Pilsner. So I see no reason not to do it again here. Uh, and then we're going to do nothing for a 90 minute boil until about 15 minutes from the end where we will add half an ounce of crystal and then half an ounce of Mount Hood. Mount Hood is a Hallertau derivative, which is the hop that the Germans would have used in their native country to make Pilsners with. Uh, but Mount Hood is a little bit more Americanized and it's a little fruitier. Uh, and in fact, I actually used it when I made an American light lager and I really, really, really liked the way that it came across. So I would love to use it again here in another American beer. And at zero minutes, we're gonna go ahead and add another half ounce each of Crystal and Mount Hood. 
To ferment this beer with, we're gonna use a peculiar yeast. Um, and this is Y yeast cow lager, uh, which is Y yeast 2112. The cow lager is actually a hybrid yeast, so very much like a Kolsch strain. Uh, it actually likes to ferment slightly higher than a lager temperature and slightly lower than an ale temperature, but it still gives us, at the end of the day, a very clean lager character, and it is a truly American yeast. So, we'll be using that. For the water profile on this one, we're looking at a more typical, uh, somewhat minerally water profile, but with nothing too crazy. We're going based off of the yellow malty water profile that is available on Brewer's Friend. And uh, we will be looking at a water profile of 60 parts per million of calcium, 6.5 parts per million of magnesium, 13 parts per million of sodium, 99 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I am adding to eight gallons of distilled water, two grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, and five grams of calcium chloride. For the mash on this beer, nothing too fancy here. We're going for a straight 60 minute mash at 152 degrees Fahrenheit, right down the middle. Uh, I'm not doing any decoction mashing or any step mashing on this one. Uh, so that'll be kind of nice and easy. And hopefully that gives us a relatively uh, decent final gravity. I'm really hoping for something around 1010 10 to 1012. 10, um, but <laughs> my experience of this brewing system kind of makes me believe it's probably going to be lower. Um, but hopefully that's not actually the case. I'm looking forward to this brew day uh, quite a bit and I'm really interested to see what kind of beer comes out of it. So all of our water is up to temperature now. We're going to go ahead and mash in. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash as usual. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for 10 minutes, and then I took a pH measurement, and I saw a measurement of 5.5, which was actually on target, albeit at the upper range. I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for 60 minutes and then I raised to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it sit there for 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and I let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a head start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity and I recorded a measurement of 10 bricks or 1039. This was actually six points lower than the target pre-boil gravity. As soon as I removed the grain basket, I added my first word hops, the one ounce of crystal, and then I let the boil continue for another 75 minutes. At that point, I added my 15 minute hop addition, half an ounce each of crystal in Mount Hood, a Whirlflock tablet, and some yeast nutrient. Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it. In my opinion, this is the easiest and best way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. Once the boil ended, I added my zero minute hop addition, another half ounce each of crystal and mountain hood, and began chilling. I let the wort chill to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then I aerated the wort with Pure O2 with a dose of about one minute at full blast. At this point, I pitched my yeast, I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 11 and a half bricks or 1045, which was about eight points short of my target OG. So overall the brew day went pretty well, but I did end up with a bit low of a uh, original gravity and yeah, there were just some hiccups in the brew day that kind of caused that. Uh, that is not actually something that should have happened and I probably should have boiled a bit longer, but yeah, it is what it is, it's still fine. Now, when it comes down to fermentation on this beer, um, this yeast is a little particular. So, cow lager yeast is typically used for California common type steam beer. They like to ferment, like I said at the beginning of the video, a little bit higher than lager temperatures and a little bit lower than ale temperatures. So if you happen to have like a nice cool basement or a cool garage or someplace where you can keep a temperature of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit uh, steady, then that's a perfect yeast for you to use. Um, so there's a 
wide variety of ways that you can actually ferment this particular beer, which is great. It's a little easier than your typical lager if you're fermenting this traditionally and just, you know, working with the actual environment around you. I would not recommend uh, fermenting this particular beer under pressure, though. This hybrid yeast has a little bit of extra character that it likes to kick out, and I don't think that that is something that is worth suppressing. These beers are really supposed to have a unique character compared to their European cousins, and if you pressure ferment them, then you're just going to get a bland lager, and if that's the case, then why make the American pre-prohibition style in the first place? So I would definitely recommend not pressure fermenting. However, this yeast responds pretty well to most temperatures that are in the high lager zone or the low ale zone, so uh, if you don't really have good temperature control in your setup, then this is actually probably a pretty good yeast to use. Unless, of course, you live in a climate where the air temperature is very, very hot, like the tropical regions, and then you might want to look into a different yeast solution for this particular beer. Maybe then I would look at something like a Kauai strain, like uh, Lutra Kauai, for example, makes a very clean lager. Uh, and you could probably get pretty similar results with that. You're just gonna be missing some of the, uh, the yeast esters that you would get with an American strain of lager yeast. You can also use uh, Fermentus W3470 on this particular beer. However, it's gonna end up being really clean. Um, and depending on what you're looking for, that might be fine as well. Uh, W3470 can handle a variety of temperatures all the way from 50 up to about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, it will make a great beer in any of those temperatures, to be honest. So the world is really your oyster in terms of how to ferment this particular beer. What I am choosing to do is going uh, the temperature controlled route. I will be using my Spike CF5 and the uh, temperature control system in that particular fermenter in order to maintain a steady 60 degrees Fahrenheit until the completion of fermentation. Uh, you don't need a fancy conical fermenter like that in order to ferment this beer. This is actually a great bucket beer. You could do a really good job with any sort of bucket fermenter in this case. And I probably would use my anvil bucket, but it's tied up with another beer. Uh, so we're just gonna have to work with Spike CF5 in this case. So in a nutshell, I will be fermenting this at a steady steady 60 degrees Fahrenheit for probably about two weeks. And then at that point, I will probably do a short diacetyl rest of maybe two or three days. And then I will close transfer to the keg. Uh, we'll get it nice and cold. We'll add gelatin findings to it. And uh, depending on how quickly it clears up, it could be one week, it could be two weeks. Um, but hopefully we'll have a nice, clean, clear beer within a couple of weeks. So I'll catch you then. Looks like the American Pilsner here kind of ended up finishing pretty dry uh, around 10.09. So that's um, that's not too bad overall though. Uh, should be interesting to see how this one does in the keg. So fermentation on this beer went pretty well overall. Uh, we actually ended up stopping at about 10 days. The fermentation was complete at that point. And honestly, at that point, it kind of tasted like it didn't really need a diacetyl rest. So I just threw it straight into the keg and we just started the cold crash phase from that point. Um, I let it sit at cold temperatures for about two weeks and I was kind of hoping that it would clarify up and it would uh, drop clear, but it didn't quite do that. So like three or four days ago, we added some gelatin findings and that also had no effect. Uh, so there is some substantial haze in this beer. Uh, there's a decent amount of leftover uh, particulates floating around in the beer. That's just gonna take a long time to clarify. That being said, and that flaw aside, the beer itself tastes very good, and I'm very happy with the way that it uh, is presenting itself outside of the appearance, so I'm very excited to share it with you. And with that in mind, I can't really do too much else to the appearance of this beer outside of letting it lager for like eight weeks, which I just don't have the patience to do, so let's go ahead and pour it so that I can share it with you now. So the beer is called 1933, after the uh, year that the 21st Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, officially ending Prohibition. Comes in at 4.7% ABV and a solid 36 IBUs. The color of the beer is a nice pale gold, uh, very similar to the other Pilsners that we've had here. Uh, a little bit lighter than the Czech Pilsner though. Um, it is unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, not clear. Um, it is, it's got a slight haze to it. I do believe that that will clear up over time. Uh, but like I said, it's been lagering for about two weeks and um, also had some gelatin applied to it with no effect. There's a nice white fluffy head on it, which is quite pillowy and quite fine. Um, and it sticks around for a long time. It also has very good head retention over time, which is quite nice to see. Next, I think we're gonna go in for aroma. And please forgive me, by the way, for filming in the middle of a rainstorm, but um, I don't really have any other options. The day is the day that I have to film. 
Um, and as we all know, this is an all-weather brewing channel, so please bear with me. On the aroma on this one, I get a, a light cracker aroma, but also a decent amount of corn. Um, and actually, at first guess, I thought that there was a significant amount of DMS that was manifesting itself in the aroma when I first smelled this because of how corny it is. But then I remembered that I actually added corn to this recipe. Um, it's definitely a little bit more corny on the aroma than you might expect. Um, it's definitely quite noticeable, um, but it's not too bad. The other thing you get in the aroma is kind of like a nice herbal character. Um, kind of like a little bit of a sweet herbal character. Uh, something a little bit more... Uh, different than your typical European hops. Uh, so, I mean, this is coming from the American hops, of course, uh, and it's actually quite nice. It just smells very fresh and aromatic. Um, it's really nice. So now we'll go in for mouthfeel. Mouthfeel in this one is actually really nice. Uh, it's somewhere between the German pills and the Czech pills in terms of mouthfeel. It's like a medium light. The water profile on this one was significantly different from the other two Pilsners. If you haven't seen the videos, the German Pilsner had a very high sulfate water profile, um, which made it feel dry and also added some significant minerality to the mouthfeel. And the Czech Pilsner had next to nothing in its water, uh, which actually led to it being very soft, very uh, delicate. This is somewhere in the middle. It's definitely got a more complicated water profile than the Czech Pils. Um, but it has a little bit more kind of full maltiness to it, I think. I really do like this, uh, the way this water profile works. A lot less edgy than the water profile for the German pills was, and there's a little bit more fullness in the mouth than the Czech pills. All right, so next up, we're gonna talk about flavor. So this is um, actually a pretty cool flavor in this one. Very different than I ever expected. Walking into this brew, I didn't really know what I was going to get at the end. Um, I wasn't sure if it was gonna be more like a German Pilsner, Czech Pilsner, or just your typical Budweiser type of flavor, but this is something completely different than all of them. As far as the American lagers that I've brewed, this is definitely my favorite. Um, it's got a lot of flavor, it's got a lot of complexity, um, and it's just really good overall. It's the American hop character that really differentiates this beer from its European cousins, um, and it makes it so much different. It's so interesting. The malt character in this is good. It's got a lot more fullness and breadiness than your typical Pilsner malt, because remember, we used six row. We didn't use Pilsner. Um, and then has a little bit more flavor imparted onto this. But despite the corny aroma, there's actually very little corny flavor in this. This doesn't taste like a Mexican lager, which is another thing I was worried was going to happen. Um, but it actually, it tastes very full, and it's more like a pale ale base. Uh, with kind of a Pilsner's mouthfeel. There's no yeast expression in this either. The cow lager yeast is superbly clean. I can't really get any yeast character out of this at all. Um, it's almost as if it was fermented under pressure. Initially I said I wanted a little bit of yeast character in this, but now I'm thinking that actually may not have been a good idea. I think I prefer the cleaner version of this. Um, so I'll take back what I said earlier in the video. Go ahead, ferment this under pressure, you'll be fine. But now let's talk about hops because this is what this is all about. This doesn't have the berry-like character that I had in the German pills, and it doesn't have the spicy character I got from the saws and the Czech pills. Um, it's something entirely different. Also of note, it has absolutely nothing of the character of an American IPA and the typical fruity hops you get out of that. There's a really fresh feeling, almost minty-like um, character to this. It is also combined with a nice, subtle citrus, uh, more like a lemony or lime-like citrus, uh, not orange tangerine or anything like that. Um, actually, I think those types of flavors would be out of place in the beer like this. This is actually a lot more welcome and it blends in very nicely. The other thing that's great about this beer is just how balanced it is. One of the most important things in making a great beer is simply balancing the bitterness and the hop character with the maltiness and the sweetness and the complexity of flavors you get in both of those areas. Uh, there's obviously more pieces to it, but that's the most important balance you're gonna wanna strike. And this beer is very, very well balanced. The malt and the hops complement each other and work together in harmony in a really beautiful way. Neither of them are really too prominent in the beer and neither one of them really dominates over the other. They just work together at equal levels in a really, really nice way. Definitely really happy with the way this beer turned out. It's a really nice surprise just to see uh, what would happen as a result of this recipe. Never made anything like this before. Um, and it is absolutely nothing like your typical American macro lager. This is a beer that I would absolutely love to drink again and brew again because it's just so surprisingly good. So if you've never made a pre-prohibition type of American beer before, I'd highly encourage you to give it a shot. It's, uh, it's really pretty awesome. Um, I'm gonna actually go ahead and get myself another glass of this. 
One of the things that's so fantastic about this beer is simply that it is a very sessionable beer, you know, less than 5% alcohol. So that means it's very easy to drink a lot of it. And it also means that it's extremely refreshing on a very hot day, unlike the rainy day we have here. It also has enough class and complexity to be enjoyable in situations other than just crushing beers. Um, and I really like that. It's a beer that can do a lot of different things. But yeah, if you were one of the people that thought at the beginning of the video that uh, American Pilsner was just some crappy macro lager, I highly encourage you to try this out and see what you think about it. This is a beer that really doesn't show up very frequently at craft breweries and honestly has uh, very little representation. I think it's starting to make a bit of a comeback and I would like to see more of these types of beers pop up because this is an awesome style uh, and an awesome beer. I know I said the Czech Pills that I made about a month ago was uh, the best lager that I've made so far. This is very, very close behind it. The Czech Pills in this beer are two of the best beers that I've made in a long time. Um, and it's really nice to have both of them on tap at the same time. So <laughs> I will be enjoying them for sure. Let me know down in the comments, have you ever made a pro prohibition Pilsner, a pre-prohibition Pilsner before, and was it not what you expected in a good way? If you enjoy the video and you learned something from it or you found it useful, please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content like this. And also I would appreciate it if you checked out the merch store that I have down below the description box. It's a great way to support this channel uh, and keep me doing the things that I'm doing. If you want to support the channel in other ways, I also have a list of all of the homebrewing equipment that I recommend and links to Amazon or other retailers where you can find that stuff uh, if you happen to be in the market for it. If you want to support me on a more personal level, I also have a Patreon down in the description box as well. If you want to follow me on more social media than just YouTube, I also have an Instagram, Instagram only, and that is at the apartment brewer on Instagram, and uh, there I'll post a little bit more frequently than I do on YouTube. If you made it this far, you guys are really my true fans, and I appreciate you guys for watching this far. It's a simple gesture, but it honestly means a whole hell of a lot to me as a content creator. A special thanks, of course, to all of my Patreon people. You guys are awesome, and you really do a lot for this channel. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you all in the next one. So until then, cheers to you.